This is the story of Northwest Airlines Flight 85. On the 9th of October 2002, a Northwest Airlines Boeing 747 took off from Detroit bound for Tokyo's Narita Airport. This was supposed to be another routine flight like any other that day. But unfortunately for all involved, that would not be the case. As the hours ticked by, the plane made its way across the United States, and then it made its way across the Bering Strait. Seven hours into the flight, the senior pilots retired from the cockpit to get some rest, and the relief crew took over. Senior Captain John Hansen and Senior First Officer Dave Smith retired to the rest area. The captain was in bed with a book, and he felt the plane do something weird. As the captain's interest was piqued, the pilots in the cockpit recovered from whatever had happened. Sensing that something was wrong, the captain started putting his uniform back on. That's when the alert from the cockpit came through. In the rest area, there's this little alarm, and it goes off if you need to get to the cockpit as fast as possible, if there's an all-hands-on-deck situation unfolding. As Captain Hansen entered the cockpit, he saw Captain Frank Guy doing something that he did not expect to see. He was struggling to fly the plane. He could see that Captain Guy was deflecting the rudder to the right with all his might. This is not what you expected to see when you're in cruise. For some reason, at 35,000 feet, the plane had jerked to the left and went into a 40-degree left bank. The pilots initially thought that an engine had failed, but the indications in the cockpit told that their rudder was deflected to the left by 17 degrees. No one had commanded this, but yet the rudder was in the left hard over. They were in a dire situation, and they needed to declare an emergency. But unfortunately, they were in a dead zone between North America and Asia. This meant that their communications were too weak to reach any of the control centers. In a bid to establish communication with the controllers on the ground, the pilots contacted nearby Northwest Airlines Flight 19. They were closer to Alaska and relayed the fact that Flight 85 was in trouble. They needed to get this plane on the ground as soon as possible, and the decision was made to divert to Anchorage in Alaska. It was taking every bit of control authority that they had to keep the 747 from rolling over to the left. They were using ailerons, the top half of the rudder, everything that they could do to keep the plane in the air. Now they had another problem. To get to Anchorage, you needed to turn to the right. But this plane in its current state could not make a right turn. So they gently eased up on the controls and sent the plane into a left bank as they tried their best to keep the plane from spiraling out of control. As half of the pilots struggled with the plane, the other pilots were hard at work in the cockpit, running through checklists, trying to fix the problem. But nothing worked. The lower portion of the rudder was still stuck. But the pilots did not really have a clear idea of what was happening. Their instruments told them that the lower rudder was deflected to the left. But other than that, information was scarce. For all they knew, the tail could be breaking apart. And if that happened, it would be game over. Captain Hansen wanted to take over from Captain Guybe. Here's a quote from him. If anyone's going to scratch my airplane, I want it to be me. As Captain Guybe let go of the controls, First Officer Mike Fagan took over as the switch happened. Once in the captain's seat, Captain Hansen was appalled at how poorly the plane was handling. He had never felt anything like that before. Just keeping the plane level was physically exhausting. You needed to basically stand on the rudder pedal to keep the plane in level flight. That taxed the pilots so much that they could only do it for 10 minutes at a time. So the captain and the first officer would take turns commanding full right rudder. With no fix in sight, the pilots got on a conference call with technicians on the ground. They hoped that the techs on the ground would be able to fix the problem. The pilots had two questions for them. One, do you know what's wrong with our rudder? And two, how do we get this jumbo jet on the ground? Unfortunately, the ground techs did not have an answer for the pilots. They were on their own. It then dawned on the pilots that they would have to land the plane like this. Landings are relatively dangerous on a good day, but today the slightest mistake would send the plane into a left roll, and no one knew if the pilots could recover from something like that. The pilots then realized that the more they slowed down, the more the rudder deflected to the left. In essence, the more they slowed, the worse the problem got. Now came the big hurdle for all of them, getting the plane back on the ground. The pilots chose to descend to 14,000 feet. The air at 14,000 feet is thick, which gave them a lot of control authority, 
but also if something were to go wrong, they would have enough time to attempt one recovery before the plane hit the water. Then another problem cropped up. In the 747, rudder signals are sent to the nose wheel. This is done so that you can taxi on the ground using the rudder pedals. They did not know if the jammed rudder would send those signals to the nose wheel. If it did, they'd be off the runway in seconds. The pilots decided that they'd use the tiller at the first sign of trouble. Think of the tiller as the steering wheel of the airplane. But more importantly, its inputs overrode the ones from the rudder. As the plane lined up, the pilots were using every trick in the book to keep the plane lined up with the runway. They were now using asymmetric thrust to keep the plane under control. This meant that they pulled back power on the engines on the right-hand side and added power on the left-hand side. This had the effect of countering the roll caused by the rudder. The pilots were now playing a dangerous game. The slightest wrong move would send the 747, with 404 people on board, crashing to the ground. But the pilots, using every bit of their skill, kept the plane lined up with the runway. And at long last, the plane touched down on the runway. But their ordeal still wasn't over. The rudder was still deflected to the left, and it threatened to send the plane off the runway. The captain grabbed the tiller as they tried to keep the jumbo jet on the center line. The captain would later say, we weren't sure we were going to be able to keep the plane on the runway. End quote. But despite their concerns, the plane came to a stop and everyone survived. Once on the ground, the pilots finally got to see what was causing them all this trouble. The rudder deflected to the left. In fact, once the plane was on the ground, they could not get the rudder to budge even though the plane was on the ground. To get the rudder to move, they had to depower the entire hydraulic system. Before we move any further, let's talk a bit about the rudder system of the 747. The design of the rudder system saved Flight 85. You see, the rudder system is split. Instead of having just one giant control surface, it's split into two sections. Both sections can move independently. Had this been one rudder, the pilots would not have had enough control authority to keep the plane upright against the force exerted by the rudder. Each portion of the rudder is operated by its own power control package. The lower rudder, which is smaller of the two, had two actuators, and the larger one on top had three. This system is set up in such a way that both rudders operate in unison, and they are also fed by two redundant hydraulic systems. These two hydraulic systems are housed in the same manifold. A manifold, in simple terms, is kind of a housing for the hydraulic system. This is done so that either of the two hydraulic systems could power the rudder should the other system fail. Tearing the system apart, they found that the manifold of the lower power control module failed. This meant that the piston that controlled the rudder could move more than it was intended to, and thus caused the rudder hard over to the left. The manifold was no longer stopping the piston from moving too far back. They then turned their attention to why the manifold fractured, and this meant putting the metal through a gauntlet of tests. Studying the cracks, they were able to ascertain that they were fatigue cracks. They sent the manifold and the entire assembly to the manufacturer for testing. But since the piston of the control system was sticking out, they couldn't test the unit as a whole. So they decided to tear it apart and then test everything individually. Everything worked fine. They even tested the metal that the manifold was made out of to see if it was up to spec. It was. There was no reason for this manifold to fail. But just to be safe, they asked all operators of the 747 to inspect the manifold for cracks. But the thing was that you couldn't visually inspect them because before they cracked, they looked fine. So the manufacturer devised a test to use ultrasonic waves to test the metal. The weird thing was that no other operator found this type of fatigue on any other 747. There are even more things that make this accident totally unique. Usually when something fails and there's an emergency, the thing that failed is a part of something deep inside the airplane. But in this case, that was not the case, as it was the housing or the manifold that failed, causing all of this. After the incident, the 747 was fixed up and returned to service. Can we talk about the pilots for a second though? Flight 85 was a textbook example of CRM in action. They had four pilots, and all four pilots took on a bit of the workload and then solved the problem at hand.
This could have gone so wrong, and it was only their skill that saved 404 lives that day. For their incredible flying, the crew of Flight 85 received the Superior Airmanship Award. The other thing that kept this plane from crashing was the split rudder. Had the rudder not been split, this would have ended very badly. How badly, you ask? Well, I have two videos on the 737's rudder issues that brought down two jets and almost brought down a third. You can find the playlist in the description. Thank you for watching this episode of Mini Air Crash Investigation. If you like the videos that I make, do consider liking and subscribing. It will really help the channel grow. I will catch you guys next time. Stay safe.